Good morning, fabulous family of faith. Come on, give God praise if you're excited to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Come on, anybody excited for another day's journey? A day that we have never seen before. A day that we might never see again. But a day that God, by virtue of his grace and his mercy, allowed us to see and to experience. The old folk would say, to be clothed in my right mind. Come on, with a reasonable portion of my health and my strength. I don't know about you, I just need about two or three who could just give God worship. Come on, who can just give God praise? Who know that it's not robbery to Shabbat the Lord after the week that God has pulled you through, after the month that God has brought you through. Come on, after the last night that you had that his head of protection was not removed from you. We got a reason. I said we got a reason and a right and a responsibility to give God worship and glory and place for those of you who are joining us online we hope you can feel that the Holy Ghost is here and that we got an expectation on 2020 Wheatland Road that God is going to meet you right where you are however you're watching us this morning from wherever you're watching us from across this city from across the country from around the world we are delighted that you are here with friendship west pastor haynes look would love to be your pastor if you're not already connected there's going to be an opportunity for you to join this church to become a part of this family of faith do me a favor hit that like button hit the share button so that this message that the man of god is going to bring today can be spread everywhere you can also hit the notification notification bell and get a notifi notified whenever we go live and do anything here at Friendship West. You do not have to miss out. Follow us. Again, subscribe across our social media platforms. We got folks in the sanctuary this morning who are ready to lift up the praise and they got palms in their hand. Come on, wave your palms so that we can see you. Yeah, we're celebrating Palm Sunday, Christ's triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem in preparation for the experience of Good Friday and ultimately the victory of Resurrection Sunday. Amen. And so as we set the atmosphere, we're also starting a new month and a new scriptural focus. And we look to the book of 1 Peter in the first chapter, the fourth verse, where we are taught about the glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We hope that you are on the road to resurrection as we are in the midst of our seven days of prayer and fasting. I can already feel the Holy Ghost moving in this place in an awesome way. And we know that God is going to meet us here and that God's going to meet you wherever you are. As we saturate this atmosphere, as we prepare our hearts for what God wants to do in this place. Let us assume a posture of prayer as we go to the throne of grace. Gracious God, our Father, you've been good, and we owe you our best praise and our best worship. Lord, we stand in need of what only you can provide, peace, joy, love, hope, deep faith that things can be better on tomorrow than they are right now. Lord, we come into this sanctuary because we need you. Only you can do what we need to be done. And so we ask that your Holy Spirit would stop by and meet us in our time of worship. 
Lord, somebody needs you. And so we say, come by here. Lord, somebody needs your healing. Somebody needs, oh God, your wholeness. Somebody stands in need of your delivering power. Lord, another is in need of your salvation. We give you thanks and praise, knowing that we stand up under an open heaven and that you can meet every need and supply it according to your riches and glory. So we say, come into this place. We urge you, we ask you, we beseech you to use us as instruments of your glory in our worship and beyond. Lord, we prepare our hearts and our minds as sanctuaries of, of God's abiding presence. We know that you inhabit the praises of your people. And so right now we make a commitment that we're going to invite you in. You're omnipresent, you're already here, but we invite your God to abide among us and to dwell among us and to, Lord, to stay with your people a while. Lord, we ask right now in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would fall in a fresh way. Lord, we need fresh oil. Lord, we pray for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, move in a powerful way upon those who stand at the doors and then allow the Spirit of God to move in a dynamic way upon our music ministry. Lord, touch Lord, the musicians and the minstrels and then, Lord, get into the choir and minister through them and then touch your band servant who's going to break the bread of life and then, Lord, prepare us to be a church to receive the harvest that you're going to bring in this morning. Make us a church that can do the work that you have called us to do until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And we're going to be mindful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor in the name of Jesus we pray. Come on, put your hands together and give God praise.
You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, but we give God praise knowing that he will indeed reign forever. As we come to this Palm Sunday and this Communion Sunday, we reflect on that fact, that Christ's kingship extends beyond even our fickleness in the face of his royal glory. Think about it. There Christ was entering the city, prepared to celebrate a final Passover meal with his disciples. Luke's gospel, the 19th chapter, tells us as he approached Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever ridden. Untie the colt and bring it to me. And if anyone asks you why you're doing what you're doing, tell them the Lord has need of it. But what does a donkey have to do with victory? If nothing else, the donkey challenges us to ask how we will respond when we learn that the Lord needs all of us. The Bible says that as he entered the city, he was pressed on every side by a crowd who laid palm trees and palm leaves in his path and shouted with one voice, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I imagine that the woman with the issue of blood was in the crowd because just a touch of the hem of his garment made her whole. I got to believe that the blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus was in that crowd because he met Jesus on the side of the road. And though they tried to make him be quiet, he would not not be heard. Jesus, son of Nazareth, he shouted. Have pity, have mercy on somebody like me. A, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a tax collector named Zacchaeus, the woman who met living water at the well. I believe all of them were there in the crowd. And Jesus was pressed by the crowd, but not impressed. Because the same people who wanted to crown him king, a few days later, would try to crucify him. So we come to this communion table, bearing in mind one crucial fact. Jesus died for everyone in the crowd. The crowd prepared to make him king. Right. The crowd working to see him crucified. Even those who crowded him at the communion table on the night he was betrayed. They crowded him but lacked the courage to stand with him. And yet he suffered and he hung and he bled and he died for everyone in the crowd. As we prepare for this Lord's Supper, though, don't think of the crowd. Posture yourself like a donkey. The people in the crowd needed to be seen, but the donkey was nearly prepared, merely prepared to be used. The people in the crowd needed to be seen. The donkey was prepared to serve. Let us search now our hearts as we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper today and ask ourselves what we will do when we discover that God has need of us.
Bible tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Let us eat together. When they had finished eating the bread, Jesus took a cup. He blessed it and he gave it to his disciples. He said, this is no more wine, but a symbol of the blood that I will shed for you and for all so that sin might be forgiven. Let us take the blood of Jesus together. Let us pray. Thank you, O oh God, for the reminder that sinners who are plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilt and stain. Thank you, O oh God, for the message and the meaning of this meal, for the service and the sacrifice that it challenges us to render. May, O oh God, the impartation of these elements consecrate us now to your service. May it make us more and more like you. May we strive to do the work to make the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May we respond not like the crown, but like the donkey, prepared to do what must be done to ensure that the Savior's work goes on. Bless us as a church family. Make us one in the spirit of the Lord, one body, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Through the Holy Spirit, according to your word, let the people of God say amen. Anybody grateful for the sacrifice that was made at Calvary? Anybody thankful that on Palm Sunday that they marched him through the streets and they cried Hosanna, but later on they yelled crucify him. And because of that sacrifice at Calvary, we got victory on Sunday morning with him rising up out of the grave. But the victory couldn't come unless he had agreed to be crucified. Anybody know that he could have chosen to come down from that cross. He could have chosen to call down 10,000 angels, but yet and still, he loved you enough, huh, to stay up on that cross. And for that today, God, we're grateful. For that today, God, we're thankful. Come on and lift those hands into this atmosphere and bless our God. Hallelujah. I heard about the Savior who came from glory. He gave his life at Calvary. He did it all just for me. Listen, church, they never give me the same. mistake I made, the thorns were formed my life. from my life. The lashes you took, they were meant for me, but you chose to take them instead. You agreed to do it, you agreed to die, you agreed to end your life. Save my over sacrifice. You made. 
That's a lot of love. That's a lot of love that took our place. That's a lot of love that loves us in spite of us. That's a lot of love. Love that looked beyond our faults and saw what we needed. That's a lot of love that refused to give up on us and took on himself what we deserved ourselves. Somebody ought to praise God that God loves you that much. God loves you that much. God loves you that much. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God didn't wait for us to get lovely to love us. God loves us unconditionally. That's powerful. Let's pray. God, we thank you and praise you for your unconditional love. We thank you. And we praise you for the blood that was shed for us that covers us and reaches from the highest mountain and flows to the lowest valley, doesn't miss any of us. Thank you for blood that gives us strength from day to day for the fact it will never lose its power. Now, God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you 
for your word and for its power, especially on this Palm Sunday, as we, O oh God, commence Holy Week. We now ask that you would speak to us undeniably, supernaturally, even powerfully. Speak to us. I'm available to be used as your instrument. You know how we feel. You know what we're dealing with, what we're thinking about, what we're going through. We need a word from you. We need to hear from you. God, if we don't hear from you, what shall we do? So please, stand in my body, take over my mind and think your thoughts. Take my mouth now and speak your word and bless your word. Give your word power. And do exceeding abundantly above anything I can ask or imagine according to the power at work within me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and hallelujah. Let's praise God for our music ministry blessing us. Amazing, wonderful. Thank you so much. Powerful. Powerful. I'm going to call your attention to the gospel according to John. John chapter... 18, and there in the 18th chapter of John's gospel, beginning at the first verse, we find the words of our text for this message. John chapter 18, beginning at verse 1 from the New International Version translation of the Greek New Testament. It reads, when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am he, Jesus said. And Judas, the traitor, was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said, Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup? The Father has given me. Look again at uh, verse Five and six, Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. You may be seated in God's presence. I want to put a tag on this text and for a few moments with your prayers, I want to talk about you better recognize. You better recognize. Smiling in your face. All the time want to take your place. Backstabbers. All you fellas who have someone you really care. Yeah, yeah. Then it's all of you fellas who better beware. Somebody's out to get your lay day. A few of your buddies they show sure look shady. The blades are long, clutched tight in their fist, aiming straight at your back. And I don't think they'll miss what they doing. Smiling in your face, all the while want to take your place. Backstabbers. I got some old school folk in the house who know that those lyrics don't come from me, but from the OJs. The OJs back in the day 
recognize that all of us, if we're not careful, will have people in our lives who are by our side, but they ain't necessarily on our side. They will kiss you to your face and hiss you behind your back. In a real sense, they smile at you in your face. All the while, they want to take your place, backstabbers. And already I'm in somebody's Kool-Aid. I've called out your flavor because you know people in your life who you thought were true, but they proved to be false. Well, perhaps that didn't get you, but OJ, I mean, Jay-Z has another spin on the OJs. I like what Jay-Z said when Jay-Z raised the question about how you could be so, how they could be so comfortable speaking about him behind his back in your presence. I guess y'all didn't get that, so I'll quote Jay. Jay said, don't tell me what was said about me. Tell me why they were so comfortable saying it to you. Now, they didn't particularly say something themselves, but they listened as an audience and they gave, as it were, the person who had a lot bad to say about you a feeling of comfort and an audience so that they could talk bad about you. And Jay wants to know, don't tell me what they said, but I need to know why they felt so comfortable saying it around you. Is there anybody in the house? or maybe you're online and that's basically your deal and that is you know people in your corner, watch this, who may not say bad stuff about you but they entertain what is said about you, smiling in your face, all the while want to take your place, backstabbers, others, watch this, may not necessarily stab you in the back but what they will do is provide the climate where your back can be stabbed. I think I'll raise the question because I'm simply asking this day, how many knives have you pulled out of your back and then when you dusted the knives for fingerprints, you recognized that the person's fingerprints on the knives were folk you thought you were close to? <laughs> Smiling in your face all the while want to take your place. Backstabbers. I see if I can make this real plain because I don't think I've gotten with some of you yet. So I'll go ahead and share. This is, of course, April the 2nd in two days. We will commemorate the 55th year since the slaying of the drum major for justice, Martin Luther King Jr. And Ricky, the other day, I'm reading something that arrested my attention. I had to download the book because a review of the book had been placed online. And as I'm checking out the review of the book, I know I have to read it myself in spite of the extensive reading list I have for this dissertation. I had to pull this down. And this particular book is about Mac McCullough. Mac McCullough, you may not know that name, but I promise you, you've seen a picture with Mac McCullough in it, for it was April the 4th, 1968. Mac McCullough, my sister's and brothers was an agent of the federal government who was spying on a civil rights freedom group, a civil rights freedom group that had assembled in Memphis, Tennessee. He had a meeting with Martin Luther King Jr. on April the 4th. As a matter of fact, he had heard King's mountaintop speech on April the 3rd. And so here he is on April the 4th in the Lorraine Motel, but not just in the Lorraine Motel, but at around 6 p.m. He is outside looking up at the balcony where Dr. King is. In just a matter of moments, there was a loud pop, and when you heard the pop, they looked up, and King had fallen backward. Immediately, Mac McCullough ran up 
the stairs of the Lorraine Motel, grabbed a towel from one of uh, the carts of the person who was serving as maid for the Lorraine Motel, grabbing the towel, Mac McCullough goes to Dr. King, and when you look at that picture of King lying on the floor of the Lorraine Motel, you will see that there is Mac McCullough with the towel, putting the towel into the gaping wound in the neck of the drum major for justice, Martin Luther King Jr. Hold on. Mac McCullough has a daughter. His daughter grew up knowing that Mac McCullough was a police officer but had no idea that he had infiltrated the civil rights movement on behalf, watch this, of the federal government of the United States of America and he, my sisters and brothers, in a real sense, had to spend so much of his life, watch this, having to deal with the PTSD, please don't miss this, of having, uh, uh, having the appearance at least of betraying uh, a movement that was designed to benefit him uh, because when you look at that picture, Mac McCullough is black. He's a black man and yet he's working on behalf of the enemy of the movement in order to infiltrate, please don't miss this, the civil rights movement and now he is putting a towel in the gaping wound of the dying drum major for justice, Martin Luther King Jr. Mac McCullough, my sisters and brothers, was by King's side, but there's a question as to whether or not he was on his side because the federal government of this empire had bought and paid Mac McCullough, please don't miss this, to infiltrate the movement and in a real sense betray the movement. I'm not coming through. If you don't get Mac McCullough, perhaps you know the name Charles O'Neill. For Charles O'Neill infiltrated, here it is, the Black Panther Party in Chicago, Illinois, and he, got, he tried to get close to Fred Hampton. He again was working for the federal government. Was this, it the CIA determined to ensure that the Black Panther Party not rise to a place of prominence and liberating activity in this country? Why? Because in both instances, Mac McCullough and Charles O'Neill were used as tools of the federal government in order to infiltrate and infect a movement for freedom and justice. And please understand, my sisters and brothers, that's what empires do. Empires love to have some in our community who are bought and paid for in order to infiltrate and infect any movement for freedom and justice that goes on in our community. And that means that what I've often heard, all of our skin folk ain't necessarily our kinfolk is a show enough reality because there will always be Judas says, ah, there's a name right there who will smile at you in your face all the while trying to take your place. And that's where we are in our text because in our text we meet heaven's hero and earth's emancipator, our Lord and liberator, Jesus from the hood in Nazareth finds himself now on the border of a Passover celebration. And the Bible says that after chapters 13 through 17, where he had engaged in a discourse that was in a real sense a valedictory address to his disciples, the Bible lets us know that Jesus finishes praying in chapter 17 and, and finishes praying and that the prayer he prayed in chapter 17 
17. And now in chapter 18, he moves with his disciples across the Kidron into a garden that was their place for retreat, a place, watch this, for spiritual respite, a place where they could chill and connect with God and one another. And the Bible lets us know, here comes Judas. Judas comes, my sisters and brothers, and watch it. He comes not alone, but he comes with a detachment of Roman soldiers and temple police officers. Please, I got to paint the picture because y'all not missing this. This is a sacred space of prayer and retreat that Judas knew about because he had been to this place of spiritual retreat and prayer with Jesus and the other disciples before. And knowing what he knew, he now leads, here it is, this detachment of Roman soldiers from the empire, not to mention police officers from the temple, and understand the word that is used for the detachment of soldiers Soldiers is a word in Greek that we get our word cohort from. And really, scholars have said it was between 200 and 600 Roman soldiers that came to a garden. I got to paint the picture, 200 to 600 Roman soldiers that have lanterns and torches that are cutting holes through the darkness of the moonlit Palestinian night and they are heavily armed with their Roman weapons and they are going to get, here it is, one Negro from Nazareth. They're going after one black man in a garden from Nazareth. I hope y'all are getting this picture. It's nighttime, only the light from the moon and the stars that bedeck the heavens as bling bling of eternity provide the light. But all all of a sudden, here cutting holes in that darkness are lanterns and torches coming from the 200 to 600 Roman soldiers, not to mention the temple police. And the Bible lets us know they are led by Judas. Okay, okay. They are led to this private retreat a place of spiritual connection by Judas. Huh, isn't it strange that whenever you're trying to spiritually connect with God, that's when there is always an intrusion and interruption. I'll just go ahead and testify myself, but every time I'm trying to connect with God in prayer, every time I'm trying to connect with God in a spiritual retreat, there is always an intrusion and interruption that is disruptive, and that's what's going on going on in our text. The text says, here Judas comes leading the enemy to a place of spiritual retreat where Jesus had gone with his disciples. And the book lets us know that Judas here begins the betrayal. Betrayal. Oh my God. Betrayal. You understand this is betrayal. After all, Judas had already been paid the money to betray Jesus. Jesus Jesus is, Jesus is played and betrayed by somebody that had been with him. And let's be real, all of us, if we live long enough and we are about something, we will get played and betrayed by those we thought were with us. Have you ever been played and betrayed? And that is you thought you could trust them and discovered that they had tricked you. Have you been played and betrayed? As a matter of fact, they acted like they were true to you and you discovered the whole time they were lying on you. Is there anybody who's been played and betrayed? And I'm simply trying to say that they act one way around you, but as soon as they are away from you, they act as if they don't know you or they are an enemy to you. Have you ever been played and betrayed? I'm talking to somebody who is experienced 
against someone who has tried to act cool around you, but behind you they were hating on you. Have you been played or betrayed? I'll give it to you like this. Judas, my sisters and brothers, had been walking by the side of Jesus. My late mentor, Manuel Scott Sr., put it this way, that Judas failed the test of exposure because Judas had been exposed to the light of the world, and yet he did a dark thing. And here is the deal. He did a dark thing because Judas, watch this. I'm about to shout someone right here. I've discovered people will betray you because of their own internal battles. Have you thought about what the name of Judas means? The name of Judas means worthy to be praised. That's a mighty good name right there. I mean, to have a name like Judas back then was a good thing. It means one who is praiseworthy, one who should be praised. That's a mighty good name. And yet even though that was supposed to be his identity, it was contradicted by what he actually did. Now, don't judge him just yet because a lot of us are walking contradictions. We want to do this, but we end up doing that. Y'all playing holy on me. Paul, would you help these sanctified folk right now? When I would do good, evil is always present. The things I should hate, those are the things I really love. The things I ain't supposed to do, that's the stuff I really kind of like to do. Why y'all playing holy on me like there's some stuff you know you shouldn't do, but if you really are honest with yourself, it sure feel kind of good when you're doing that thing. I'm just trying to let somebody know that if you're not careful, your own internal conflicts will cause you to engage in acts of betrayal. And that's exactly what Judas did. He fails the test of exposure because of his own internal conflicts. And watch this. My question is, Jew, how could you be close to Jesus and see him heal the sick and raise the dead? How could you see him take a two-piece and five biscuits and feed those who were food insecure? How could you see him use the hem of his garment as a traveling pharmacy so that those with pre-existing conditions could get healed just by touching him? How could you, Judas, do Jesus like that who transformed funeral processions of devastating heartbreak into family reunions that were festive and convivial. Jew, how could you do this to Jesus? And Judas again says, quote your main man, Manuel Scott Sr. Manuel Scott Sr. shared with me that there was a preacher in Los Angeles after Doc had moved from Calvary in L.A. to St. John here in Dallas, a preacher in L.A. who loved Doc at one point, admired Doc, but then tried to undermine everything Doc had done in his ministry there in California. And Dr. Scott gave me this insight. I downloaded it on my mental computer, and now I sermonically print y'all a copy. Dr. Scott said, always remember, there's a thin line between admiration and resentment. Okay, y'all, okay. People will admire you, but resent they can't be you. Freddie Haynes, you preaching up in here. Yes, I am. Let me come talk to y'all. People will admire you, but resent that you can do what you do because it makes them feel less because they can't do what you can do. And so somehow they see you as the enemy. Now, 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 I'm going to share something here that I've never shared before. And I really, really kind of thought about it long and hard, but I'm going to go ahead, Deb, and just share because here's what I've... I, I, I experience betrayal, uh, and I get it a lot. I mean, it happens a lot. I don't know what it is. People just think my back is a knife. 
uh, fa- knife place. But anyway, uh, when I'm in college at now defunct but never dead Bishop College, uh, there was this cat. And what happened, I'm, I'm writing a chapter for a book on the history of Bishop College on preaching. And so as a consequence, I go and look at an old Bishop College yearbook. Two weeks ago, I'm skimming through the yearbook and all of a sudden I see the face of Judas. Let me tell you about Judas. Judas did me real wrong. Judas, uh, and, and, and check this out. This is, this is 1981, 1981. So you got to go back a ways. And in 1981, because I was working while going to school, uh, I had a telephone and a television. Now, y'all not impressed. <laughs> because y'all have kids with cell phones at the age of seven. But I didn't have a phone in my room my first few years at Bishop. We had to use the pay phone. You ain't heard of that. A pay phone in the lobby. Ricky, can you feel me? All right, so so, so I I had to use a pay phone until my junior year. My junior year, I couldn't wait because I'd been working and I got me a phone, landline. (laughs) So, (laughs) Judge, you feel me, don't you? So I got a landline and I had a television. And so this dude had just come to school, hot freshman, basketball star and all that stuff, and he'd come to my room every day to watch TV and inevitably to use the phone. And it was cool because he's a cool dude and, and all that stuff. And so every day, he'd watch TV, then he'd use the phone. Watch TV, then he'd use the phone. It's November, we're coming to the end of the semester, and my phone bill came. Now, you don't know nothing about this, but we used to have to pay for long distance. And... And, and, and the phone bill came, and when the phone bill came, my phone bill, I'm a college student. It's 1981, Marsha, 1981, phone bill came. My phone bill was $538.62. I still remember. $538.62. I went through that phone bill after speaking in an unknown tongue to see where the charges had gone to. I only had made like four calls to San Francisco to my mother, and so four calls did not come to $538.62. And as a consequence, I'm hot going through that bill and seeing a, a certain city and a certain number, because I ain't giving his name away, a certain city and a certain number on repeat all throughout four pages of my $538.62 phone bill. I go through that thing. They are all charges that he had charged up. I did not have that kind of money. I put that phone bill on the floor and ran out the room trying to find this, and I could not find him. I went all over, fill in the blank. Don't act holy on me right now. I went all over that campus. I went down the gym. I'm going to find him. I'm getting my money. I did not find him. And then two, a week later, we're about to go into finals. I know his class schedule. I follow the class schedule because I know he's got to take finals. I find him and I greet him with some nice words. And then I say, and y'all stop judging me in your mind right now. Because if somebody ran up a $500 phone bill on you, you ain't saying praise the Lord. found him. I, found, I, said, I, said, I, I said, after I said some other stuff, I said, man, what's up? How are you going to play me like this? I said, I need my money right now. I need $500 right now because they're cutting off my phone next week. He said, man, I ain't got it, but I'll, I'll get it to you by Monday. I said, I ain't playing with you. I need it by Monday. And I didn't tell you all this part. So, uh, So there was a girl I was dating at the time, and she kept telling me, he ain't no good. Sisters be knowing. They be be peeping. 
they be discerning. And, and she told me, he ain't no good. He ain't no good. He ain't no good. And, and after I got my phone bill, she said, I told you, he ain't no good. And you won't listen. Y'all, do you know within two weeks, she and I were done. We were done because she said I would not listen to her. And I'm like, why are you going to quit me over him? <laughs> me? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't, ju- don't judge me. Don't judge me. So check this out. Check this out. So check this out. He never paid me. I couldn't find him that next Monday. And they cut off my phone. They cut off my phone. I could not find him. Fast forward five years. I run into the sister I was dating at that time. She asked me, how's your boy? Gave his name. And so I said, after he ran up my phone bill, I never saw him. And then she told me this that messed me up. She said, I told you he was no good. Do you know when I was waiting on you one day, he sexually assaulted me. I said, what? I said, why didn't you tell me? She said, because you're crazy. (laughs) Don't judge me. She said, and I know if I had told you what he had done to me, you would have sacrificed your future and been in jail. And I said, yeah. And I said, if I ever find him, I'm going to deal with him. She said, I've been to counseling. I'm fine. I'm going to be fine. But you need to watch people who get close to you. He was your Judas, and you didn't even know it because you were. But I'm not done. Fast forward 10 years later. I'm preaching in another city. I get up to preach, and when I got up to preach, this happened. I got up to preach. I get up to preach. I read my scripture, announced my subject. I moved into my introduction, and all of a sudden, I look in the audience. It's him. This mofo is in church. I know you're judging me. I know you're judging me. But he's in church. And not only is he in church, but listen, I'm preaching and he does this. It took everything in me, Uncle Lamb, everything in me not to say I'm so glad to see and call his name and then say he's a known sex offender as well as a lowlife who still owes me $538.62. And he's out there waving his hand in the air like he just don't care. I really wanted to do that, but, I, but the Holy Ghost wouldn't let me and, 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 and made me preach harder. And I'm closing, and he stood up. Yes, sir. pronounce the benediction he comes down to speak to me he came down to speak to me I'm right here he came down to speak to me and 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 and, and the church had had the the uh, what do you call it? armor bearers armor bearers and so I said I need y'all you see him and they say yeah what's up and I said I need you to grab me because he may not make it out of here alive and they said, oh, you want us to protect you from him? I said, no, you didn't hear me. I need you to protect him from me. And y'all, he came up to me and he said, Fred, and tried to give me the bra hug. And I, I stepped back. I said, y'all watch him. There may be knives in his hands. He's trying to hug me, and he's going to put the knives in my back. Y'all watch him. They said, Pastor Ains, you so funny. I said, I ain't laughing. And y'all, he said, he said, he said, Fred, what's up, dude? What's up, dude? Dude? Ain't your dude? 
He said, and, and it's a line of people waiting to speak. So I got to maintain some kind of holy decorum. Because I don't want, you know how y'all judge me. So, 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 so I got to maintain a holy decorum, but I'm wanting to cuss him out. And so, and so I said, man, where's my money? And then I said, I heard what you did, and I gave her name. I heard what you did. He said, he said, man, you still upset about that? I said, I'm still upset about that? That's what you got to say to me? You owe me $538.62. Worse than that, you had the nerve to sexually violate someone I was dating. I let you in my space, and that's what you decided to do. And then he said, well, man, you had everything. Even my girlfriend liked you, so I thought I would just pay you back. And then he turned around and walked out. That's the end of the story. I ain't seen them since. If I do see them, pray. Because I still want my $538.62. But the bottom line is I got betrayed. And I'm letting someone know right now that people will betray you. But before you get all high and mighty, if you don't deal with your own internal stuff, you may betray some people yourself. And so in our text, here is Jesus of Nazareth betrayed by his own. And the Bible lets us know when he got betrayed by Judas, that Jesus in essence lets us know when you know who you are, God somehow can and take what others do to you and use it to work out for you so that you can let go of what they did and move on to what God is up to. I think that's where I want to go in these few moments and bless somebody and let you know, yeah, it may happen. Yeah, you may get done dirty, but I serve a God who has a plan for your life that's bigger than what others have done to you, and God can take what they do to you and somehow you Use it to work out for you as long as you have the faith to say to them and that situation you better recognize. Now, that ain't original with me either. I got that from Sam Sneed and Dr. Dre back in the day because Sam Sneed came out with a song called You Better Recognize in collaboration with Dr. J. And when somebody says in hip-hop culture, you better recognize, it means don't you miss out on recognition recognizing my authority. Don't you miss out on recognize what I've got going for me. You better recognize here in the text, watch it, they come and Jesus doesn't wait for them. Jesus goes to them and says, who are y'all looking for? And they say, Jesus, the Nazarene, Jesus says, I am. Now, if you've seen the text, he ain't in there. He is added by translators to make the English understandable. When they said, Jesus, the Nazarene, Jesus simply answers, I am. I ain't got no real church folk in here who know the Bible because if you really knew the Bible, you'd run out of here shouting because when Jesus said, I am, it's only one person qualified to say I am because my Bible lets me know that when Moses was on the backside of the desert and the bush was burned with fire and yet the bush would not burn up, Moses said, I need to know what your name is. Say your name, say your name, say your name. Say your name. And Moses said, I can't get, God said, I can't give you one name because if I give you a name, you'll define me. If you define me, you'll confine me. So when the folk ask you what my name is, just tell them I am because that's all you need to know. I am that I am. I am the self-existent one. And the Bible says that when Jesus stood and said, I am, 200 to 600 soldiers and police officers, they stepped back and they fell down. Are y'all getting that picture? Jesus said, y'all better recognize I am. 
Oh, I'm going to get my shout on today because somebody came to church is online and you've been betrayed. But here's the word. Just say, I recognize I am. And when you recognize, here it is. I'm almost done. The text says, oh, this shouts me right here. There is power in self affirmation when everything is going against you. There's power in self affirmation. Ah, Paul Tillich called it the courage to be. Self affirmation when everything is against you and when everything is against you and yet you can say, I am. That's the power of identity. Our preacher last Sunday, she was so amazing. She said, she talked about the importance of knowing who you are. I want to piggyback on that and simply say, Francis Cujo Waters, that there is power in knowing who you are. Your real power is in your sense of identity. Whenever you don't know who you are, that means there is a weakness to you. But when you know who you are, there is a strength, there is a power, and you walk around like you know who you are and when you walk around like you know who you are other folk recognize your power and when they recognize your power it's rooted in your sense of identity no wonder Jesus could go into the wilderness and Satan say if you are the son of God turn these stones into bread Jesus Freddie Haynes remix it for us Jesus said I ain't got to prove to you who I am by satisfying my appetite my Daddy just said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I ain't got to prove nothing to you. It is written, we don't live by bread alone, but by everything that comes out of God's mouth. I know who the hell I am, so go to hell. trying to let you know there's power in knowing who you are. There's power in standing in the strength of your identity. Jesus stood there and said, I am, I am, I am, uh, 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 Dr. Shively Smith, my brilliant professor, one of my favorite of all time, Shively Smith, in our class on 19th century, the, uh, interpreting the New Testament through 19th century African-American women writers. Awesome class, awesome class. And in this, she said, always understand, who is going to shout y'all, that when the ex-enslaved black folk wrote their own memoirs, it was an affirmation of identity and snatching their power back from what enslavement had tried to do to them. Because enslavement, here's what she said, negated their person. Enslavement, I'm, do, I'm, I'm doing this for Mr. Anti-Woke, Governor DeNazi there in uh, 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 Florida. Enslavement was determined to erase their name erase their history, erase their sense of identity, disconnect them from their religion and from their God. And so when they became free, the first thing most freed Africans did was to change their name. Oh, I'm about to mess y'all up. Araminta Ross freed herself. When she became free in Philly, they asked her her new name. She said, Harriet, 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 Harriet Tubman. Oh, Harriet, I love you so much. You know what I did? I looked up the name Harriet. It's etymological meaning. It's going to shout you. It means ruler of the estate. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go talk to y'all. Y'all seem like y'all came to have some church. Harriet had been enslaved. Now she's emancipated, and she names herself ruler of the estate, meaning I'm running this thing right now. 
Y'all used to think you could run me, but I'm running this thing right now. My name is ruler of the estate, and I'm trying to let somebody know that Harriet knew there was power in knowing your name, power in knowing who you are. I won't forget this as long as I stay black. I was preaching, not preaching, but I was, I was at Howard University. I was really in D.C. in, what was it, 2013. Uh, 2011, 2015, I was at D.C. a lot because uh, Avenue was going to school at Howard. And so, but 2013, it happened to be the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. And I got invited to the White House uh, night before the march. I got to speak at the march. And then, here's your shout right here. And then I got to speak at Howard that Sunday. And I wasn't on to preach, but when Dean Richardson heard I was there, Dean Richardson says, come on. And there was another preacher on, but Dean Richardson said, I want you to get up there and just talk for 10 minutes. I said, what? He said, just get up and talk for 10 minutes. And so I got up there, and Ricky, the Lord came over me, and I talked for 10 minutes. And I mean, they went crazy. And I ain't bragging, I'm testifying, okay? That's what's going on. So they went crazy. It was just crazy. 10 minutes, 10 minutes. I sat down. Once I sat down, afterwards, Reverend C.T. Vivian, Google him, you should know him in this church. C.T. Vivian, you know him, don't you, Rick? C.T. Vivian came up to me and said these words You're the greatest preacher I've ever heard. Now, that's homiletical hyperbole. You know, preachers, we, we can do that sometimes. We exaggerate. So I, 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 but it meant something because it was C.T. Vivian. C.T. Vivian who stood on the steps there in Alabama and got beaten, bloodied by a vicious Jim Clark. C.T. Vivian who Martin Luther King Jr. said was the greatest preacher he had ever heard. And he says that about me. And when C.T. Vivian said, that I just hugged him. I said, thank you for your service, your ministry, your preaching, your prophetic word, your sacrifice. And C.T. Vivian said, but you know what? You're supposed to be a great preacher. He said, look at your name. Your granddaddy was a great preacher. Your daddy was a great preacher. And then y'all have the nerve to have Frederick Douglass. You're supposed to be a great preacher. And then, and then he said, he said, you, 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 you can't help but do it. And then I saw C.T. Vivian a year ago because, because I was in D.C. because Congresswoman Maxine Waters had me address the finance committee uh, there in Congress. And so I'm on to address the finance committee, which is predominantly Republican. And I see C.T. Vivian on my way in, and I told him what I'm about to do. He said, you're going into the lion's den because we're addressing the payday loan hot mess. And so I go to speak, but C.T. Vivian stops me and says, don't forget your name. I said, what are you talking about? He said, when you go in there, you don't forget your name. I said, I know my name. He said, no, no, no. Your name is Frederick Douglass Haynes III. Your granddaddy was a great preacher. Your daddy was a great preacher. Your name is Frederick Douglass, named after the silver-tongued orator for freedom and abolition, the prophet for freedom. Don't you forget your name. You go in there and remember who you are. And he says, if you know your name when you stand before that Republican-controlled committee, just act like you belong. Just act like you know who you are. Your name is Frederick Douglass. Now act like Frederick Douglass. Your name is Frederick Douglass Haynes. Act like Frederick Douglass Haynes. I ain't bragging. I'm testifying. I wish y'all had seen me. I stepped off in there, and they made you watch this. Read your uh, testimony. Y'all, I put my testimony to the side because y'all know how I roll. I got my script, but I don't need my script because God gave me a mind and a memory and I stood, I stood there and looked them Republicans in the eye and my last line was and Jesus is going to say to this committee I was hungry and you gave me a payday loan and when I said that Maxine Waters shouted "Woo, y'all it all happened because C.T. Vivian said remember your name and act like it I came to tell somebody 
when Judas betrays you, remember your name and act like it. Remember your name, child of God. Remember your name, royal priesthood. Remember your name, light of the world. Remember your name, salt of the earth. Remember your name and act like it. There's power, power in knowing who you are. I'm almost done. Here it is. And then, here's the good news. When you're betrayed, power in knowing who you are. Don't let what they do to you take you from you. But then, oh, I love this. When they betray you, you are preserved by a promise hanging over you. Jesus said, I am. They fell back. Jesus said, all right, who y'all looking for? Get up, get up. Who y'all looking for? And they said, Jesus Nazarene, told y'all I am. Since y'all looking for me, let them go. Right. <sighs> it's, it's 200 to 600 of y'all with weapons. Amen. Let my boys go and, and just take me since that's who y'all came for. Those disciples were, were protected by a promise. Here's your shout. The shout is that they're protected by a promise because Jesus had already prayed, God, I have not lost any of them. And so because of that promise, Jesus says, I'm going to preserve you. I'm going to protect you. And I'm trying to let you know that some of us are still here. We've survived a whole lot. It's because there's a promise that is hanging over our lives, a promise that God made that when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the flood, they will not overwhelm you. And through the fire, you will not get burned. You will get preserved. I'll give it to you like this. Uh, I'm having a lot of flashbacks in these 40 years. And so here's what happened. I had a flashback, and some of you will remember this name if you go back with me to Polk Street. Sister Newhouse. Sister Newhouse was sweetheart of a woman. Sister Newhouse, watch this. I never will forget this. She had been missing from church for a couple of months. She never missed church, y'all. And she'd been missing for a couple of months. And so I went to go see her. When I went to go see Sister Newhouse, she was just all happy to see me and stuff. And here's what she said. She said, Pastor, I'm so happy to see you, she said. And she began to share with me the stuff that had happened to her. She'd been stabbed in the back financially by family. And so as a consequence, she was saying, Pastor, so I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that. Lights got turned off, and she told me all the stuff that had gone down in her life. And so I gave her some money, and then I said, Sis Newhouse, we're going to help you out. Sis Newhouse said, no, 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 you, 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 you take that money back. I know you ain't making much. I know what we pay you. You take that money back. And so I said, Sis Newhouse, God will be mad at me if I don't leave this money with you. She said, don't you, don't you give me that money. And so, y'all, I literally had to back out of her house and throw the money in order for her to receive it. But this is where she blessed the mess out of me. Sister Newhouse said, well, just know, I plan on being at church Sunday and my testimony is the Lord spared me. Boy, if I was in an old school church right now, folk would be running and shouting because that's an old school testimony. The old folk, every now and then, they would say, the Lord spared me. The only reason I'm here is because the Lord spared me. The only reason I didn't survive my sickness is because the Lord spared me. The only reason I've survived hell and high water is because the Lord spared me. Is there anybody here with the Lord spared me testimony? with all the hell you done been through, with all the pain you have suffered, with all the drama you've had to overcome, is there the Lord spared me testimony in the house? I could have been dead sleeping in my grave, but the Lord spared me. I'm only here because the Lord spared me. My heart's been broken. My mind's been under attack, but I'm here because the Lord spared me. I'm done. I'm done. The text finally says this. It says this. It says, watch it. 
power and identity preserved by a promise. But finally, the text, there's a purpose over your life. So stay focused through the betrayal because Sunday is on the way. Ah, oh, Freddie Haynes, you just said something right there. You stay focused. I know it's dark on Thursday night, but if you stay focused, Sunday is around the corner. If you stay focused, there's resurrection around the corner. Stay focused because there's a purpose. And those, watch this, who have hurt you are going to help you to get where it is God is taking you. Oh, Judas, Judas, you a low life. But Judas, here's the good news. God can use Judas to get you from where you are to your destiny that God has designed for you. I know it hurts. I know it breaks your heart. But Judas can be used by God when Judas thought he was using you to get you where God is trying to take you. And so here's what happened. Y'all see the text. Peter is packing. Because Peter... Probably one of them folk who believe guns solve everything. You know, here's what we need. We need teachers armed with guns in schools. How stupid is that? Teachers need to be armed with books. Teachers need to be armed with resources and computers and iPads. They don't need to be worried about having to shoot somebody. They need to be worried about doing education for our kids. I hurt for our children growing up in an age where you have jackassical policies that are being passed by these jackassical politicians who have no sense of, y'all forgive me, I just came cussing mad today. I'm trying to let somebody know. And, and text says, watch this, Judas, 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 I mean, Peter takes a knife, uh, uh, no, a sword, and he swings. Malchus evidently ducked. Peter missed his head but caught his ear. And Jesus said, put up your sword. Jesus said, put away your guns. Jesus said, get some gun regulations. Jesus said, we need some serious regulations so we can have gun control because you're a real sick nation if you ban books, but you won't ban guns. You're sick. You're sick. You want to ban books, but you won't ban guns? There's something sick about a country that does that. And so, so y'all know what happened. Jesus said, put that mess up. Uh, I ain't going out like that. Judas, you do what you got to do. Because what you don't understand, Judas, is God's going to use you to help me get where it is I'm trying to go. And Judas, watch this. The dirt you've thrown on me is going to help you dig your own grave. And that's what you got to know. You ain't got to pay Judas back. You ain't got to spend no time going after Judas. Jesus' Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. You ain't God's paymaster. I'll write them a check. I'll handle up on them. And Judas, the very dirt you threw on Jesus, you're using it to dig your own grave. And the good news is Jesus said, Judas betrayed me. I got lynched on Friday. Friday, but if you hang out till Sunday, you're going to find out I'm coming back. If you hang out till Sunday, you're going to find out I'm going to rise again. I'm done. I'm done. Last year, I'm preaching in Houston, and there is a storm that hits that city on Wednesday. And a storm hits the city on Wednesday. This is going to shout you. Hits the city on Wednesday, and my host invites me to his home for dinner. And the host invites me to his home for dinner, and we're grubbing on the food. The thunder is roaring. The lightning is playing its zigzag games against the black bosom of the sky. And before I know it, the little girl who's his daughter is real precocious, and she says, Daddy, I'm scared. And he says, it's all right, honey. You're in here. Daddy's got you. And then she said, okay, Daddy, well, you don't mind if I sit in your lap while you eat. And he said, yeah, I'll feed you and me too. And so she got in his lap, 
thunder, that time roared, lightning flash, and she didn't budge. And, and Daddy said, you're not scared? She said, why would I be scared? I'm with Daddy now, so I'm not going to be scared. And then, watch this. That's not even the shout. That was good. I'm, I may preach that next time. But, but the shout is this. The news is on. The weather forecaster comes on. The weather forecaster said, this weather's going to be bad. And I'm looking at it because I'm leaving Thursday, and I got to make sure that my flight is going to be okay. Weather forecaster said, we're going to have rain all day tomorrow, flash floods probably on Friday, going to be real bad on Saturday. But the good news is Sunday, the sun, watch this, is coming back. Okay. I'm going to talk to y'all. Y'all seem to get this. Uh, Thursday, we're going to have more rain. Friday, flash floods. Saturday, the rainstorm's going to keep coming. But the good news is Sunday, the sun is coming back. And when he said the sun is coming back, that little girl jumped out of her daddy's lap and stood up and shouted, hallelujah, the sun is coming back on Sunday. And when she said that, I wiped a tear, but then mama said this, a black mama, the mama said this, she said that part. <laughs> See, if I had some hip-hop folk right now, Y'all be running out of here shouting on me. I, ne I need my hip-hop folk to know. I love how we use language because in our community, we're so colorful. We always got to just do something different. And so whenever we hear something true, we say that part. <laughs> y'all got me. I, I, I see. I know y'all ain't been in church all your life. And, 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 and so, so if you hear somebody say, this is going to be this and this is going to be that, and you know that that they said is true, you say that part. And so when that girl said, hallelujah, the sun is coming back on Sunday, mama said that part. And y'all, all I want to say to anybody that's been betrayed by your Judas, I don't want y'all to give up because I serve a God who is still sits high and looks low. I think you like that, Ricky, that part. I serve a God who can take what they meant for evil and somehow turn it for good, that part. I serve a God who says all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to God's purpose. Y'all going to catch this in just a moment. I serve a God who says, I'll prepare a table before you in the presence of those that betray you. I serve a God who can say no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I serve a God and now I can testify the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid when the wicked, even my enemies came upon me they stumbled and they fell is there anybody here who knows that there is a God who will protect you who will preserve you who will deal with your Judas and hold you until Sunday morning so I got a that part testimony can't nobody do me like Jesus can't nobody do me like the Lord he is my friend that part he's God all by himself that part God is a mother to the motherless and a father to the fatherless that part God is a bridge over troubled waters that part God will make your enemies your footstools that part that part that part that part that part that part anybody got a that part testimony hurt 
you. But no weapon formed against you shall prosper that part. They meant it for evil, but God, that part. I love the Lord, heard my cry, pitied every groan. Long as I live, troubles rise, I'll hasten to his throne. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You better recognize. That's all I came to. You better recognize. Listen, every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Oh, my God. Ah, don't push me. Don't push me. I kind of feel a kind of way right now. Don't, don't do that. Yeah. 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 Ah. yeah.
Listen. Listen, every head bowed, every eye closed. God, right now I cover in prayer everyone who's been betrayed, wounded, heartbroken because of what was done to them. God, in Jesus' name, heal. In Jesus' name, heal. In Jesus' name, heal. Remind us who we are and give us that power that we, oh God, may live in the power of self-affirmation, knowing who we are. Remind us of who we are in Jesus. And then, God, thank you for preserving us. Thank you that you spared us. Thank you for sparing us. Thank you for a purpose that gives us the strength to hold on till Sunday. God, right now, I cover in prayer everyone under the sound of my voice. Those who have been betrayed, heal. Those who betrayed themselves, deliver. And in the name of Jesus Christ, save those who are lost. In the name of Jesus Christ, set free those who are bound, heal those who are broken. Connect to your church those who are disconnected. In Jesus' name. Listen, as we pray for you, if you're here and you feel led to join church, give your life to Christ. Today's a good day to do that. All you got to do is stand up, step out of the aisle you're in, and come on down front. Got some wonderful ministers of the gospel who will share with you in a private area how today can be a new beginning, a fresh start, new life for you. And so if you've come to church or you're online and you feel led to give your life to Christ, I highly recommend it. You can't go wrong. It's the best thing you can ever do is to give your life to this Jesus. This Jesus who died for you so you can live. This Jesus who will give you hope beyond what happens today. This Jesus who will let you know Sunday's on the way. This Jesus. This Jesus. So if you're here and you're not saved, you're here. And you know it's time for you to give your life to Christ, to get right with God. I want you to stand up, step out of the aisle you're in, come on down front and give your life to Jesus Christ. Please don't wait, don't hesitate, don't vacillate. God is speaking, God's spirit is moving. Won't you come and won't you come right now? You're here and you're saying, preacher, I'm tired of feeling lost, lost in myself, lost in my sins, lost in situations. I don't want to be lost anymore. If that's you, stand up, step out of the aisle you're in, come on down front and give your life to Christ. Listen, online, you can call that number 469-498-0210 or email us, join us at friendshipwest.org. We'd be happy to have you as a part of our church family. But if you're in the house, stand up, step out, come on down and give your life to Jesus Christ. In the balcony, risers, main floor, wherever you are. Preacher, well, my deal is this. I'd like to join church. I'd like to connect with this church family, this community. We'd love to have you. I'd love to serve as your pastor. So won't you right now stand up, step out, come on down and join church. Preacher, I just moved to Dallas-Fort Worth from another area. I got a church home back there, but now I live here. I work here. I go to school here. I don't have a church home here. I'd like to join church here. If that's you, stand up, step out. Come on down and join church. God's spirit is moving. God's word has been spoken. It's your time right now. Won't you stand and won't you come? Give your life to Christ. Join church. Do it right now. Bless your heart. That's awesome. That's awesome. That is so awesome. Bless your heart. We're glad to have you. Come on. Give your life to Christ. Join church. Come on. Do it right now. I love that. I love that. You know what's so amazing is that God touched them and you're out there. God is speaking to you, but you don't want to be the first one to move. And so your thing was, I ain't going up there first. And I don't know if it's the right time. And so God touched them. That lets you know you ain't got no excuse now. 
It's really okay to stand up, step out, come on down, and give your life to Jesus Christ. So if you're here and you're ready to give your life to Christ, if you're here and your thing is this, I need that connection with Jesus Christ. I need that connection with the church, the body of Christ. If that's you, stand up, step out, come on down, give your life to Christ, and join church. Or preacher, here's my deal. In all honesty, I used to go to church. I stopped going. I know I need to get back in church today. Today's a good day to get back in church. So stand up, step out, come on down, and let's get back in church. Here's the deal. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. We're getting ready to stand. When we stand, the choir's going to sing. And when they start singing, that's your signal. Stand up with us. Step out of that aisle you're in. Come on down front and give your life to Christ and join church. Y'all ready? Shall we stand? And won't you come right now? Come on, give your life to Christ. Join church. So what's up? What's holding you back? The Bible says, the day you hear my voice, pardon not your heart. When God is speaking, why are you not going to make a move? Because the best thing you can do is give your life to Christ. The best thing you can do, the best decision you can ever make is to say yes to Jesus. Listen, Jesus is waiting on you, wants a relationship with you. And I know you're saying, well, I don't want to do it in front of all these people. People, you better get over people because people ain't got a heaven or hell to put you in. People ain't going to see you through what you're going through and give your life meaning and purpose. You need a Savior who knows you, who made you, and knows what you're made for. So you ought to come on down and give your life to Jesus Christ. And then you're saying, well, I don't know. I'm going to wait till next Sunday, Easter. Next Sunday, I promise to you, all you have is right now. And I tell you, all of us who know Jesus will testify. The only regret we have knowing Jesus is not doing it sooner. And so won't you right now, come on, give your life to Christ. Join church. Choir's going to sing one more time. That's your signal. God is waiting on you. Come on right now. Can't nobody. Welcome home. Welcome home. So glad to have y'all. So glad to have y'all. Listen, let's pray. God, thank you so much for new life in Christ. Thank you for our beloved new family members. We pray your blessings upon them. Fill them with your spirit. Order their lives in your word. Use us as their family to love on them, care for them, 
build them up, that they may become all that you would have them to. In Jesus' name, amen and hallelujah. God bless you. Please go with our ministers. They're going to share with you in a private area. Would y'all welcome one more time our new family members. God bless you and welcome home. God bless you. That is so amazing. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. God bless you. We're getting ready to move toward the close. I have a few things to share with you. Number one, it's offering time. It's offering time. Please prepare your gifts in a liberal and loving fashion. First of all, listen, you know how good God has been to you. That's enough. That's enough. When you know how God has been to you, when you know how generous God has been, that's enough right there. But then think about the fact that sometimes we are getting in our own financial way because of the fact that we don't obey what God's Word says. Obedience is better than sacrifice, my Bible says. The Bible says bring the whole tithe into God's storehouse. The tithe, the tenth off the top that says, God, you number one in my life. God, you're first. You own everything. I manage manage what you blessed me with and we give that back to God so I invite you right now to give knowing that you don't want to get in your own financial way but also give because it's a blessing to give because you're blessing the work that God does through this church I'm so proud of what God does through this church on the regular I'm talking we don't wait till Thanksgiving and Christmas to take care of those who are houseless we do it all year round as a matter of fact, some of our houseless VIPs, they worship with us every single Sunday. We feed them. We bless them. But guess what? Ministry that is extensive is expensive. So please invest in God's work and help us to do the great work that God is blessing us to do. You can text to give 972-200-9419. You text FWBC to that number and the amount. There's the QR code. Scan it. Give through that safe vehicle. GiveLify app. Search out Friendship West, give through that vehicle, or friendshipwest.org. Follow the prompts on the screen or the FWBC app. You can give that vehicle, but through that vehicle, or you can give old school with that envelope. And so please do it, and we will give on our way out. All right? These things, and then we're done. Number one. Hallelujah. I'm so excited, so proud of the fact that our ministry led by Pastor David Malcolm Magruder. We're in a season of prayer and fasting right now. Started yesterday through Good Friday, through Good Friday. Seven days of consecration. Please join us on this road to resurrection. Join us Wednesday night for a wonderful time, Holy Wednesday of prayer. And then next Sunday, next Sunday, 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock, 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock, 8 o'clock. For those of you who want to rush to brunch, you can come, say you've been to church, and we'll have a quick service for you, okay? And then at 10 o'clock, we're just going to go all out and have us a great time, all right? But please, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock next Sunday on the road to resurrection. It's going to be fire, and we are excited about that. Pastor Magruder, where's Pastor Magruder? He went out. He said he had an announcement. All right. Well, there is a pastoral care hotline. If ever you find yourself hospitalized or with a family member who was hospitalized, this is the pastoral care hotline. Or if you, watch this, experience bereavement and you want that Friendship West love and service, please get that number down, 972-228-7241. 972-228-7241. That's the hotline number, okay? Hotline, hotline. Please dial that number and we will do all we can to serve you, to be a blessing to you. It's April. If you were born in the month of April, we want to show you some love. That means you're what? Is it Aries and Taurus, something like that? All of y'all stand up so we can give you some love. It's your birthday. It's your birthday. We're going to praise them like it's your birthday. So, 
Happy birthday to you. God bless you. My prayer goes out to each and every one of you that this will be your best birthday celebration ever. But wait, that the year will be better than that. God bless in Jesus' name. These your children to have the blessed best year ahead. May this celebration be one that reminds them that they are precious, that they are amazing, and that they, oh God, will live that out. In Jesus' name, amen and hallelujah and happy birthday. Did y'all get married this month? If you got married in April, please stand so we can give you some marriage love. Do you know what this month is? It's your anniversary. And so happy anniversary. God bless you. God bless these unions in a powerful way. Surround them with your love. Renew their love for one another. May this month be a wonderful commemoration and celebration as they continue to build their life of love. In Jesus' name, amen and hallelujah. All right. Oh, oh, I messed up. Okay. Special remarks, Deacon Wallace and Alicia Trusty. Oh, my bad. Okay. Good afternoon, Bishop West. On behalf of committee, Deacon Wallace and I would like to invite all of you and also our community viewing virtually online to join us the weekend of April 28th through April 30th for a weekend of celebration as we honor our amazing senior pastor, Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III. <laughs> Friendship West, on Friday, April 28th at 8 p.m. downtown at the brand new Thompson Hotel, we will be hosting an elegant gala that is very representative of our pastor, his style, his taste, and his swag. Join us for an evening of dancing, great food, inspiring words from, get this, House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries. Smooth melodies from R&B legend Stephanie Mills. Dance tunes from Natural Change, who here in Dallas we more commonly refer to as the Paul Rogers Band. So make sure you bring your dancing shoes. Tickets are on sale now. You may find them at www.eventbrite.com, www.friendshipwest.org backslash events, which is our events page, or www.friendshipwest.org backslash our hyphen pastor. Trust me, you will not want to miss this. This black tie formal event uh, is selling fast, so you wanna make sure you will get your tickets. Tickets will be on sale until Wednesday, April 26th, or until we sell out again. April 26th or until we sell out. So that means it's possible that tickets will be gone before then. Then on Sunday, we hope that you will be in the house and join us for worship service uh, at 10 a.m. on Sunday, April 30th, where Dr. Maurice Watson will be back as our guest preacher. And also at 12 noon, we will have the unveiling of this year's 2023 Frederick Douglass Haynes III, Justice Walk of Fame inductees. This year, we are inducting and will honor Dr. Yvonne Yule, Miss Shirley Ison Newsom, and Dr. Harry S. Wright Sr. All, yes, yes. All who are uh, courageous and uh, trailblazing educators, and Dr. Rice is, Wright was, is also an amazing uh, preacher, as well as he previously served as a dean and president at Bishop College. Um, also for the month of April, just to give you some of the rest of the lineup, on Sunday, April the 16th, Dr. Ralph Douglas West will be back in the house. Wednesday, April 19th, Dr. Cynthia Hale will be back again. Sunday, April 23rd, Reverend Jeffrey Johnson will be back. And as I previously mentioned, Dr. Maurice Watson will uh, round out the uh, month on the 30th. 
Now, I did hear some applause, but in my best uh, Dr. Haynes voice. Y'all not impressed? Okay, I was just checking, because that sounds uh, pretty amazing to me. So we, meaning the staff and the committee, are so excited. We hope that you all will join us um, this entire month as we continue to shower with Dr. Haynes as he celebrates his 40th anniversary with much love, appreciation, and gratitude. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know if you were listening, you heard of all of the worldwide and statewide and national -wide, nationwide accolades for our pastor, and they're all true. This is our opportunity to show him how much we care, how much we love him, how much we appreciate his leadership. Now, we've been asked to give for a certain amount, $400 per ministry, $40 per person. That's the minimum. You certainly are welcome to give more. Certainly, I know that Pastor Haynes deserves more. So let us be sure that we follow through. And this is our opportunity to show tangibly how much we appreciate Pastor Haynes. And I'm looking forward to us all doing our part and better in this process so that we certainly show this will be a benchmark time where we can really set the mark for how we want to show our, our appreciation for Pastor Haynes each and every time, uh, each and every anniversary. So thank you very much. We look forward to you doing that. And we certainly want to be over the top in this entire process. Thank you very much. Ready to go. We're getting ready to go. I promise you. I'm sorry for preaching so long. I'm going to do better next time, okay? But I want to do this right quick. Uh, I'm so happy to see this, this brother is, I mean, he's really my brother. I just love him. We don't even talk a whole lot. But I just, I got a special love for Ricky Smiley that I can't even, I can't even, I don't even have words. I just feel like we are, we, we just connected, man, on so many levels. And I just want you to say hi to us, okay, Doc? Because, you know, we love you here at Friendship West. Say hi to us, man. Come here. Say hi. This is Ricky Smiley, y'all. And, uh... He's been through a whole lot, a whole lot, and we've been praying for him, haven't we? And he still makes us laugh. Ain't that a trip? Still makes us laugh. And I see people all, when I travel all over this country, Ricky, people stop me and say, how's your brother Ricky Somali doing? Tell me we're praying for him. And, and, and then and somebody said to me this week, young brother said, I'm praying for Ricky Smiley, but I'm not just praying for his bereavement. I'm praying because he's just crazy. And so, uh, and he said, he makes, he cracks me up even when he's hurting. So let's thank God for this gift to all of us. Civil rights activists, comedic genius, most of all, a child of God who loves us loves God and just does it for us, man. And he wore this on me today. He wore this on me today. <laughs> uh, a lot of people don't know, uh, Pastor Coleman, Oklahoma City, was with him last night, told me to tell you hello. I did Alpha Kappa Alpha, and we drove from Tulsa. So I got back and drove because I wanted to come to church. <laughs> I don't want to stay in a hotel. So we, after my show last night, I drove from Tulsa back to Dallas. So I took a nap and came on church. So I wanted to be here. Uh, first of all, thank you for being a leader. Thank you for receiving me when I first came here. Uh, to Dallas over 15 years ago, and uh, and you can see my loyalty. We down like four flat tires, and uh, <laughs> and I absolutely uh, uh, love Pastor Hay. I want to thank everybody for their prayers. It has been a challenge. I uh, never been through uh, anything like this. Uh, you know, uh, even in that time, um, like I said last night, if I never felt the goodness of God in my whole life, was through this process because stuff like that, losing a child, will make you lose your mind. You know, still have to get up and do radio in the morning. I, I could have took two weeks off, but on the third day I got on up, I said, well, not like, 
No, I don't want no lightning to come down. Well, on, on the third day, I got out of the bed. I didn't arose nothing. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want no lightning to come down. It just sounded like that, because that, that Wednesday, okay, y'all know what I meant. I don't have that kind of power. Uh, just to be able to get up. And I had to do radio, Pastor Haynes, because, you know, uh, people that listen to the radio, we have 8 million listeners every morning. Their kids died also. Their mothers died. Their fathers died. Their grandparents died. They're on the way to dialysis. They're on the way to chemotherapy. And much is given, much is required. And I have to realize that it's not about you. And people didn't stop dying when my son died. So the work continued. My son was 32. The lady last night said, hey, my daughter was 13. And then you hear all of the stories and stuff. And, and that's why you have to keep pushing. You have to cry it out. You have to pray it out. You have to, when you get in a good spot to laugh and have a good time, you have to make sure that you have a good time to charge your battery up. But I'm saying all that to say this, no matter how bad it is or how bad you think life is or, or the challenges that life throw at you, that, man, the God that we serve is just so absolutely awesome. We serve a powerful God, and that's why I'm here. I'm just here to give God the praise. I think what you said, you said, um, you know, he's a heart fixer and, and a mind regulator. And I never understood that. My grandmother used to say that all the time. You know, when we was growing up, God is a heart fixer and a mind regulator. Just to be able to get out of the bed this morning, just to be able to drive down here, not pull over on the side of the road, be half of your mind, part of your mind wants you to just drive over in a ditch and throw it all away. But you got kids, you got grandkids, you got people depending on you, people like that. So you have to keep pushing. So if there's any parent in here that's going through that and been through that and anybody struggling with kids, we have to start having a, a, a clear conversation about uh, fentanyl, about drugs. I lost a son at 32. I lost a niece and a nephew at 32 in two years at age 32. And we have to have these conversations. We can't give kids everything they want. We have to, parenting is not a popularity contest. Sometimes you got to be in the house. It got to be quiet in the house. I'm sorry. It's got to be quiet in the house. Sometimes you have to go in there and just cook something for yourself since I don't nobody want to talk to you. It's not a popularity contest. We got to give kids more of what we had as opposed to what we didn't have. You understand? Give them choices. You know, we don't ask my grandson whether he want to eat. Whatever I fix and put in front of him, you blessing and eat it. You don't get to tell me what you don't like. And, and just because my son left my parenting is not changing. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to soften up. I am standing strong and I'm grounded in my parenting principle because I'm raising a king to be suitable enough for your granddaughter. So, I, and I just, and I'm telling, if you got an uncle, if you got a deacon, if you got a pastor, anybody willing to step up to the plate because the father's not there, do not undermine the process. It's tough. Parenting is tough. Braces hurt, but they correct the smile. <laughs> and now nobody want to put on braces. Everybody teeth crooked. The shooting, the fentanyl, the drug use. Can't sit on the porch. Can't enjoy your retirement. Can't do nothing. Can't go nowhere. Can't go to the fair. Can't go to the circus. Can't go nowhere. Because there's no discipline and there's no structure. So, and, and everything you preached about, I, I just had to put my head down because you just wrote uh, my whole life when you talked about Judas and, and being betrayed and being mistreated and being talked about just for trying to be an alpha man and trying to show leadership in the family where there are no men. Where men that sold drugs and did drugs were celebrated and men like myself that have boundaries and structure get attacked and talked about and use keep your wallet open but your mouth closed uh -uh. so my son and I we had a, a estranged relationship but I still loved him but sometimes I had to love from a distance 
in order for him to respect me as a father. And God, in his own way, decided to do what, what he had to do and what he needed to do. And I miss my son. I love my son. But, we, but now my duty is to go out to try to make, because my mother says some, some have to die so others can live. Yeah. So in our ministry, we got to talk about what's killing our kids. Fentanyl, they putting it in marijuana. We got to start talking to our kids in middle school. They putting it in candy. They giving, they find any ways to get your kids addicted to stuff. And learn, talk to your kids. Talk to them. One, one puff off some weed, and they dead. A lady told me last week, she said, my son smoked weed. He took one or two puffs, and we found him dead in the car on the side of the house. That's how serious it is. So let's have the conversation, and we give God the glory, and God going to uh, allow me to have a platform just where we can try to save lives. So I thank you for your prayer. I love you, Pastor Haynes. Beautiful. Uh, thank y'all. Y'all was awesome. I'm going to get back down there hammering one day, one Sunday. Y'all let me play. He said, come on now. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, all right. We can sing something in G. <laughs> Thank you, God, for Ricky Smiley, y'all. What a gift. What a gift. What a gift. Amen. We're getting ready to go. Where is Deacon Eugene Young the third? Deacon Eugene Young the third. There you go, Deacon. Deacon Eugene Young the third. I, I need y'all to know we got a Hall of Famer uh, here. Deacon Eugene Young the third. Uh, is being inducted this coming Saturday into the African American Education uh, History Archives Hall of Fame for the, Texas. He's being inducted into the Hall of Fame. He's a Hall of Famer. He's already in the Texas Black Sports Hall of Fame. And now he's going into the Educators Hall of Fame. And we all know what an educator exemplar he is. Man, we salute you. We're proud of you. And y'all know he can sing too. So he's just in every Hall of Fame there is. God bless you, Deke. Congratulations. Well deserved. Well deserved, man. Proud of you. God bless you. Thank you. Please now receive the benediction. Doc, is that you? Good to see you, doctor. Dr. Griffin is in the house. Y'all, Dr. Griffin had a stroke, a stroke about a month ago, right? Two months ago. And man, you look good, Doc. Look at God. God is good, man. You looking good. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause God's face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of God's countenance upon you and grant you peace. Go now in the power of God's Holy Spirit. Here's the word you better recognize in Jesus' name. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. That was fire, and we're fired up that you were here for it. You know what would be hot? You're checking out at Friendship West so that you can like, share, or subscribe us on social media. It helps more than you'll know. And also, please go to www.friendshipwest.org and find out even more about this powerful Christian movement. You'll feel all warm inside to see how your prayers, your offerings or monetary gifts, and your investment of volunteer time can help make a difference with this difference-making ministry. For all who were here as visitors, you can share you were here by taking time to text FWVIZ to the number 28950. If you're fired up about joining our family of faith, don't fight the spirit. Instead, call now. 469-498-0210 or email 
Join us at friendshipwest.org with your first name, your last name, and your cell number. Either way, it will be lit to hear from you. Friendship West Baptist Church.